The old prophet said, These words are like a lamp for your feet, so you can see where to walk, and words are like a light for your pathway, so you can see where to go. With words, you can show somebody where to step and where to go. One of the best phrases I could give you for the day is this. Don't be lazy in language. Don't be lazy in language because the gift of language can create a career. It can help somebody see the way into the future. It can help somebody change from who they are to who they would like to be. It will help you see the gift of your own intellect. There's an innate vocabulary in all of us that helps us to see, helps us to translate what's going on in the world, what's happening, so that we can make good decisions instead of poor ones. We can make fewer mistakes this year than we made last year. One of the major things to pray for is to be gifted in language because it can have such a dynamic effect on your children, your business, your customers, your business partners. Not to continually get better and better at the gift of language would be a great mistake. So jot this down. Make one of the books a very important book, and that is the dictionary. Come to a word you don't understand, and look it up. So, what is this word, vocabulary? You need the practice. Practice everywhere. If you're going to give someone a gift and send a little card, practice making this little card something to keep and remember for the rest of their lives. Not ordinary, extraordinary. Not like everyone else, different than everyone else. It's the practice of using your gift of saying things another way until a light turns on. Another way that expresses something heartfelt that the standard or ordinary language wouldn't express, couldn't reach, couldn't paint these mental pictures. It's okay to give flowers, but don't let flowers do all your talking. Flowers have a limited vocabulary. Guess what flowers say? You remembered. That's about all they say. Flowers don't say, nobody in this world affects me like you do. Love. Flowers talk, but they don't say that. You've got to put in the little card. Nobody in this world affects me like you do. Love, and then you sign it. And see, long after the flowers are gone, somebody's going to keep the words. The words are more powerful than the flowers. So don't let flowers do all your talking. Be if you can't choose the words that are meaningful, words that are unique. And the more you do this, practicing every little occasion to say something well, whether it's a little talk to the family gathering or whether it's training or inspiring or a little class on Sunday morning, whatever it is, keep improving. Keep improving. Find a new way to say it, a new illustration, a new story. You'll get better. When my wife Judy and I parted ways, wow, that was a unique experience. I wrote this little note, Dear Judy, as often as the night comes, so does my sadness. As constant as the day arrives, so is my love for you. I wish for you and I wish the best for you. And I understand that dilemma. My life is here where you touched me. If ever you would call, I would be there to be touched again. It wasn't very long, it was just a few words but I tried to express what was going on in my heart and soul at the moment. So, I'm asking you, don't fail to say it. Here's an expression we've heard. Words are no substitute for action. That's true. Let me give you another one. Action is no substitute for words. It's okay to do, 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 but you've also got to say, say, express it as clumsy as it might be to start. Start a better program of better communication, saying it better, saying it better. Here are the four steps to good communication. Step one, vocabulary. First of all, vocabulary. You've got to work on your vocabulary. Some of my friends conducted a survey among prisoners participating in a rehabilitation program. They weren't particularly looking for this, but here's what they found. There's definitely a relationship between vocabulary and behavior. The more limited the vocabulary, the more tendency towards poor behavior. And when you think about it for a while, it makes sense. Words are a way of seeing. If you don't have a good vocabulary, you can't see very well. Can you imagine the mistakes in judgment when you can't see very well? At Harvard University, they did an interesting study over a period of 50 years to find out why some people moved up financially in their lives and why some countries moved up financially. Regarding people, it had to do with vocabulary. A wise man once asked me, what is the purpose of words in human life? People said, well, to communicate. He said, yes, but it's more than that because a word is a condensed thought, and one word can have many meanings. Think of words like love, freedom, family, and success. 
These can fill entire books and libraries. So he said, every word that you know is a condensed thought. The more words that you know, the better you can think because you can put these words together into more complex thoughts. As a result, you can think better and make better decisions. So what they found is that people who have the very best vocabularies rise to the top of their societies. The more words that you learn and understand, the better you can think, the better results you get, the better life. Next, words are a way of expressing what's going on in your head, what's going on in your heart. What if you can't see well and you can't express well? You can imagine the tragic scenario of five years of that, 10 years of that, 20 years of that, showing no improvement. Behavior now becomes a major problem, and that person's world gets smaller and smaller and smaller. Why? They can't see and they can't express. And finally, they don't need much bigger place than a 10 by 12 cell. Their world is so small anyway. Don't need much bigger place. I'm asking you to stretch your vocabulary. To build my early vocabulary, I used to put three or four words I didn't know on a card, put it up on the sun visor in my car. Back in those days, I traveled a lot by car. Sure enough, by the end of the day, I mastered two or three words. And since vocabulary is a way of seeing, if you can't see well, you can imagine the errors you can make and how they compound as life unfolds. So it's very important to have a good vocabulary. So I would ask you, one of the most important books in your library should be the dictionary. Step 2. Sensitivity. Next to sensitivity, you've got to understand where people are coming from, where they've been, what's going on. Sensitivity training is so important. People not like you, people that have got challenges and problems and difficulties. You've got to do your best to be sensitive to other people, where they find themselves, the pit they might be in currently, what's going on. Be sensitive to that. Always remember, people are carrying a heavy load. There was a wonderful line I read that said, if every person who complains about their problems could come from all corners of the earth and pile their problems in a heap, and if each person could see the size and gravity of the problems of others, they would sneak forward shamefacedly and take their petty problems away and creep into the night. And I think it's an interesting thing when you consider that we have problems, but so many other people have vastly greater problems than us. And when you tune into other people's problems and concerns, it's amazing how much better your life is. Here are two of the greatest things said about Jesus. One, it said he was touched. He was touched by where he found some people. He was touched by the misery he found some people in. He was touched. And here's the other word. He was moved. It said he was moved, touched and moved. If you really want to communicate well, you've got to be touched and moved, not just by your own drama of life, but by the drama you know is going on in other people's lives. Sensitivity. How does an adult who's 40 talk to a child who's 12? You've got to be sensitive, not just to your current situation, one of the best ways to identify with a 12-year-old when you're 40 is to remember when you were 12. Go back, remember the scenario, and let it hit you again. Let it touch you again. Mr. Schultz, who only went to the 8th grade in school but gave me a classic point to ponder when I was 25 years old, put it in such simple terms that I've never forgotten it. Let me put it in those same terms for you. Here's what he said. Learn to express, not impress. That was so helpful for me because it's easy to engage in language just designed to impress instead of express. But as Schultz said, if you want to touch somebody, learn to express sincerity from the heart, not impress. Impress builds a gulf, express builds a bridge. Identification is building a bridge. If you're meeting somebody for the first time, it's simply getting acquainted, building a bridge, making contact. Here's one of the clues. Find something you have in common. That's where you start, something you have in common. The clue to really affecting people is to start with where they are before you try to take them to where you want them to go. Meet people where they are. If somebody's hurting, you've got to meet them in the hurt. If somebody's in trouble, you've got to start with the trouble. The key is to start where somebody is. If they're in trouble, you've got to start first of all talking trouble. So when somebody is stricken in the heart, and you've had this experience, maybe not as deeply but somewhat of an experience of being stricken in the heart. When you meet somebody and you're trying to help them, you can talk about being stricken in the heart, and it'll have substance, it'll have meaning, it'll have depth. 
And you start there and then start building the bridge and start building the path towards solving the problem. Step three, read your audience. Here's number three, read your audience. So let me give you some clues on reading. Number one is simply to listen. Part of reading is listening. You pick up a lot of clues as to what else to say. Well, to say by being a good listener. From early times, I think we've learned that to be a good speaker, you've got to be a good listener. If you want to communicate well with someone, you talk, let them talk, you talk, let them talk. In fact, Mama said, with two ears in one mouth, you should listen twice as much as you talk. So active listening is very, very important in relationships. Active listening means the person is really there. Put down the magazine or newspaper, turn off the television set, lean in, be there the whole time. And sometimes people are shy. And I can tell you this. The way that you overcome your shyness is very simply this. Tune into the other person, ask questions, and then listen carefully to the answers. Seek first to understand, then to be understood. Get out of yourself and don't be preoccupied with what the other person is thinking about you. Instead, focus on encouraging the other person to talk about them. The more the person is talking about themselves, the more they like you. Seek first to understand, then to be understood. When you go home at night, don't talk about your day at all. Instead, ask her and ask the kids about their days and listen closely. The more you listen, the more the person trusts you. The more they trust you, the more they like you. The more they like you, the more they open up to you. So treat your members of your family. Treat everybody you meet as though they were your best customers. Their jokes will be funnier. Their conversation will be more interesting. You'll pay better attention. You'll have far more patience. Just try that. And by the way, as I mentioned, women are wonderful communicators. They're fabulous listeners. They're far better than men. Men are 95% more likely to interrupt a woman than a woman is to interrupt a man. Pause before replying. When you pause before replying, it raises the self-esteem of the other person because it tells the other person that you're carefully considering what they said rather than just jumping in. Question for clarification. Always ask. How do you mean? How do you mean exactly? How do you mean? Well, that's interesting. How do you mean? Well, that's really good. How do you mean exactly? And then listen and practice listening. And finally, feed it back. Paraphrase it in your own words. Remember, when you can paraphrase what the person said, this is the real test of listening. This is where you really prove that you were really listening. So, paraphrase it in your own words. Well, let me make sure I understand what you said. You're concerned about this and this happened and that's what happened. Aha. Uh -huh. Now, take the time to paraphrase and think about paraphrasing while you're listening, and you'll always be a better listener. Number two. You've got to read what you see. Part of it is just being conscious, right? Body language, reading what you see. Here's what we teach in leadership skills. Don't mistake courtesy for consent. In a polite society, we learn sometimes to be courteous, but that doesn't mean we buy the story. With somebody being polite, smiling, and nodding, you've got to make sure you don't misread that and stop short of the full persuasion. Don't mistake kindness for acceptance. In a polite society, we've learned to be kind, but that doesn't mean we've accepted. So, part of this is a little more subtle in reading. In a polite society, whether or not somebody is buying your argument, if they're being persuaded by your presentation. So, body language, picking up those signals. Now, here's the one that's probably the most effective, but it's probably the most elusive, reading the emotional signals. This is an area probably where women have it over the men, picking up the emotional signals. I think men can learn these skills, but I think women have a lot of this automatically. But it's something we all have to learn. Emotional signals, picking up the signals of whether to change your language, be sharper or to be softer, to go after a problem or to ease back and give it time to soak. Part of this is just picking up the feelings, picking up the emotions, being sensitive to the situation. This is not easy stuff. This is extra learning stuff, extra skills. But this is called summit learning for those extra measures of rewards that come from communicating by learning these extra skills. Very important to read your audience. How are you coming across? What is the effect? From a child to an auditorium full of people reading. Here's the final part on intensity. Words mixed with emotion. Words mixed with hate. 
Words mixed with love. Words mixed with faith. Words mixed with courage. That's what's powerful. Words have a certain effect. But words loaded with emotion have an incredible effect. Words loaded with emotion can move nations. They can help people change directions. Look at Hitler and his ability to preach. Look at Stalin, his ability to preach. Lenin, as wrong as they were, they believed it with all of their heart. Disastrous results, but they put everything they had into it. The emotional content was unbelievably powerful. Yes, in an evil direction, but it can also be used for a good direction. This intensity, strength, power, emotion. My words may reach you, but if I can't touch you with my spirit, if I can't touch you with my emotions, my feelings, my beliefs, then I probably haven't affected you very much. The feelings, the belief, the commitment, all that I am. If I can put more of what I am into what I say, no telling what miracle I can rot. No telling how much of an effect I can be. Real persuasion comes from putting you into what you say. But now, here's part of the clue, and we call these extra refinement of leadership skills. Learning to measure your emotions. That's very important, to learn to measure your emotions. You don't need an atomic explosion for a minor point, enough but not too much. We call this understanding how to measure the flow of your emotions to cover a point. Okay, but if it needs heavyweight stuff, you reach and get it. If it needs a milder approach, you learn how to measure it in milder, easier terms. But it's very important to measure your emotions, your feelings. So, here's the key to effective communication. Well-chosen words mixed with measured emotion. The basis of affecting people with good communication. Well-chosen words mixed with measured emotion. And one last point on communication. If you want to get good at communication, you have to be aware of doing it every day as a practice session of getting better. So that when the real important occasions arise, you will have the gift, and you'll have the style, you'll have the sharpness, and the clarity, and the substance, and the emotion. I have a key phrase for you. Actions are no substitute for words. Don't fail to say it. Now, we've heard the old expression, words are no substitute for action. That's true. Talk, talk, never act. That's not good. But this also isn't good. Act, act, and never talk. Accept every opportunity to go make a little talk. If that's going to be your business, get better at talking to your kids. Come up with more illustrations. Come up with more ideas. Read an extra book on how to communicate with teenagers so you'll have something a little better to say. And then, just practice it. Get good at it. Get better at it. Practice everywhere. If you're going to give someone a gift and send a little card, practice making this little card something they'll keep and remember for the rest of their lives. Not ordinary, extraordinary, not like everyone else, different than everyone else. It's the practice of using your gift of saying things another way until a light turns on. Another way that expresses something heartfelt that the standard, ordinary language wouldn't express, couldn't reach, couldn't paint these mental pictures. It's okay to give flowers, but don't let flowers do all your talking. Flowers have a limited vocabulary. Guess what flowers say? You remembered, that's about all they say. Flowers don't say, nobody in this world affects me like you do, love. See, flowers talk, but they don't say that. That you've got to put in the little card. Nobody in this world affects me like you do, love. And then you sign it, and see, long after the flowers are gone, somebody's going to keep the words. The words are more powerful than the flowers. So don't let flowers do all your talking. See if you can't choose the words that are meaningful, words that are unique. And the more you do this, practicing every little occasion to say something well, whether it's a little talk to the family gathering, or whether it's training, or whether it's inspiring, or a little class on Sunday morning. Whatever it is, keep improving, keep improving. Find a new way to say it, a new illustration, a new story. You'll get better, the gift will belong to you, and the effect could be electrified. When my wife Judy and I parted ways, I wrote this little note. Dear Judy, as often as the night comes, so does my sadness. As constant as the day arrives, so is my love for you. I wish for you, and I wish the best for you, and I understand that dilemma. My life is here where you touched me. If ever you would call, I would be there to be touched again. It wasn't very long, it was just a few words, but I tried to express what was going on in my heart and soul at the moment. So I'm asking you, don't fail to say it.
Here's an expression we've heard. Words are no substitute for action. That's true. Let me give you another one. Action is no substitute for words. It's okay to do, 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 but you've also got to say, say, express it. As clumsy as it might be to start, start a better program of better communication, saying it better, saying it better. It's not the money that buys you a future, it's your skills that buy you a future. Money and no skills, and I'm telling you, you're still poor. Money and no ambition, where are you? Money and no courage, you're broke. A little bit of money and a whole lot of courage, that's all we need. Because here's what all of us need for the 21st century. Business skills and life skills. Let me quickly give you a list of the skills that changed my life forever. I knew how to milk cows, but it didn't pay well. Here's the first skill I learned to change my life. Getting a customer, making a sale. If you share a unique product, talk about its merits, persuade someone that it's the best, and they agree to buy it. That's the simple art of sales. So, we're not talking high-powered spacecraft technical skills here. It's simply sharing something you've discovered with someone else and doing it well enough so they agree to participate. Now, here's what happened when I learned sales. It multiplied my income by five. Now, it didn't take that much because I wasn't doing that well in farm country, but it did multiply my income by five. Sales, getting customers, laying that incredible foundation for an entrepreneurial career. So now, I've got two skills, milking cows and making sales. Here's the next one I learned that changed me forever. Recruiting, introducing the business opportunity to new people, learning how to give a good invitation, giving two kinds of presentations, formal and informal. And the third part of recruiting, of course, is following up once you start a new life. Now you've got to take care of it like a new mother would take care of her baby. You don't start a new life and abandon it. You start a new life and nourish it like a mother and protect it like a father. You've got to be both mother and father to a new person. Nourishment, ideas like a mother, protection. Help defend your new life against the encroachment of outside voices that would try to talk them out of it. So you've got to be a mother and father in this art of recruiting. We call it being a sponsor, and being a sponsor is like being a bridge. Helping somebody from darkness to light, from skeptic to faith, from not knowing to knowing, from no confidence in themselves to starting to gain confidence. You're the bridge that helps people from the shadows to the sunlight. It's one of the most exciting positions to occupy in all of the network marketing industry, being this bridge. That's what the recruiting magic is all about. You've got the answers they've been looking for, the answers. You've got the answers, and you help them cross this bridge. You see something in them before they can see it in themselves. You assure them that it's possible to be more than they are. Therefore, they can earn more than they've got have more than they possess. This is one of the great arts in the world. And here's what's exciting about this art. It pays big money. Now, you operate a unique philosophy taught first in the Bible. John Kennedy taught it in his inaugural speech. Zig Ziglar's got one of the best ways to put it, and that's the secret to wealth. The secret to wealth and fortune, first taught in the Bible, because the question was asked, how can we achieve greatness? Great wealth, great power, great influence, great recognition, great self-esteem. How can we achieve greatness? The master teacher was asked, and here was his formula for achieving personal greatness. Find a way to serve the many. For service to many leads to greatness. For those that are interested, some people aren't interested, but for those that are, service to many leads to greatness. Someone says, the best I can do is just take care of myself, which is okay but it doesn't lead to greatness. Sometimes I've got enough bills on my own. I can't worry about someone else's bills. That's okay, but it doesn't lead to greatness. Greatness is helping people pay their bills. You forget about yours because if you help enough people pay theirs, yours disappear. Help people with problems, your problems disappear. The key to greatness, the master teacher taught, is finding a way. Now a lot of people would like to serve many people, but they don't have a way. And what's exciting about you and your business is you've now got the way. Whether you use it or not is up to you. Whether you cash it in or not is up to you. Whether you make a fortune or just a little, that's all up to you. Each person's ambition. It's called the same marketing, the same product. These products are the same for everybody here. 
The marketing system is the same. The difference is each person's philosophy and each person's individual ambition. But whatever your ambitions are now, you've got the ways and means. And here's what you've got. The ways and means to serve as many people as you would like. Now here's what's exciting about recruiting with what you're involved in here. You can directly and indirectly affect the lives of dozens of people. Some of you are going to directly and indirectly affect the lives of hundreds of people, and some of you, if you wish, can directly and indirectly affect the lives of thousands of people. And the pay is accordingly. If you affect a few, you earn net pay. If you affect the many, you earn net pay. But the secret is found in the Bible. Service to many leads to greatness. Now John Kennedy said it in his inaugural speech. Here's what he said, don't ask. Don't we wish that was the current political philosophy? Where is John Kennedy and his philosophy? John Kennedy said, don't ask. That's important if you understand philosophy. He said, don't ask what the people can do for you. Don't ask what the country can do for you. Don't ask what the government can do for you. That's not how you get rich. That's not how you have high self-esteem. That's not how you get trophies to put on the mantle above the fireplace. Asking what the people can do for you. Don't ask, he said, what the people can do for you, but ask what could I do for my country. And the country means the people. What could I do for the people? I want trophies. I want recognition. I want high self-esteem. I would even like a chance to make a fortune. John Kennedy says it's easy. Don't ask what the people can do for you, but ask what could I do for the people. Could I directly and indirectly serve many in my country? Now, Zig probably said it. Zig says money isn't everything, but it ranks right up there with oxygen. Zig, you're right. Zig says, my dentist told me, Zig, only floss the teeth you want to keep. You know, forget the rest. But here Zig is famous for this. Now, this is one of Zig's philosophies, and it goes right along with the other two, the Bible and John Kennedy. Here's what Zig says. If you help enough people get what they want, you can have everything you want. If you help enough people get what they want, you can have everything you want. Now, wanting everything you want, we call that self-interest. But it's okay to have self-interest if you do it in a positive way by helping enough people get what they want. You can have everything you want. Now, you can accomplish all that by learning this next skill called recruiting. And I learned it, and it made me fortunes. So now I've got three skills, milking cows, making sales, and recruiting. Here's the next skill I learned that paid big money, organizing. Once you've got a few, get them to work together. See, that's magic. Getting people to work together is magic. Yes, it's challenging, like having several members of your family, getting them to work together. It's challenging, but it's magic when it happens. But everything magic is challenging. You just gotta jot that down. Everything magic is challenging. But once you figure out the challenge and go for it, then the magic happens. Let me tell you how magical people working together is. Let me quote the Bible again. It says, if two or three agree on a common purpose, nothing is impossible. Just try that on for your mental size. If two or three agree on a common purpose, nothing's impossible. Everybody's looking for a challenge. Here's what I teach, especially the kids. Here's the best challenge in the world. Let's go do it. Now you go do it. Let's go do it. If two or three of us decide on a common purpose to do it, nothing's impossible. Incredible working together, organizing. Now, when everybody's an independent, now it's a little more challenging. Like having kids, they each got their own opinions, they each got their own ambitions and desires. It's challenging, but that's what makes life, the variety. And it is in your business. It is challenging getting people to work together. It's like herding cats. Sheep are easy, but you've got to try cats, herding cats. But if you can possibly get it done, the power is so immense when you get people to work together. Here's one of the powers of working together, shared testimonials. If I've got somebody new and you're there and I'm there, I give them my testimonial, you give your testimonial. Maybe what tips the scales in getting me a new person is not my testimonial but my partner's testimonial. Somebody I'm working with, their testimonial got them. Shared testimonials are so powerful. That's why working together is powerful. Now, working by yourself is okay. All this stuff is okay. Everybody needs to know though, where are the advantages? And these are some of the advantages. 
I learned to organize, pay big money. Here's what I next learned to do. Promote. Promotion now pays staggering money. Now, the company comes up with what we call major promotions. Here's what you've got to come up with, the smaller promotions. The company comes up with major recognition. You've got to come up with small recognition for your people around you. The top five. The company's got top five. You've got your own top five in maybe two or three categories. Top five, top five, top five. And those little recognitions to reach certain levels in the company, you have to take major steps. But for your recognition, let them take small steps. Here's one of the secrets. Rewarding people for small steps of progress. Rewarding people, sometimes it's just recognition, handshake, pat on the back. Mary, you're doing a fabulous job. And you figure out what those recognitions are, small steps of progress. Guess what? Promotion pays. If you learn it well, big money. Getting people to do something they wouldn't ordinarily do by themselves. People will do some unique things by themselves. But if you can figure out a way to say, Mary, if you do this and this, she says, well, I'll go for it. Now, she wouldn't have thought of that on her own. Here's what works magic. It's better than money. Money is a bit unimportant. Here's what's important, ingenuity. The best place to wake up your ingenuity is what you're doing right now. Representing a unique product and getting customers, recruiting distributors, promoting, and all this stuff. Ingenuity, figuring out a way. If it doesn't work this way, we'll work another way. I used my ingenuity, made a fortune. I learned promotion, and it paid big money. Here's the next I learned that paid big money, communication. How to conduct a meeting. I learned identification, logic and reason, attack and confess, solution, simple deals on communication. Wasn't easy for me at first. I stood up to give my first presentation. My mind sat back down. Ever been through that? Opened my mouth. Nothing came out for a while. But here's what I did. I did it again. Just jot that phrase down. I did it again. That's the secret to how I got here, 3,040 years later. It's how I got here. I did it once, it was uncomfortable. That first presentation was so lousy, if I hadn't been doing it, I'd have gone home. It was not that good, but here's the secret to how I got here. I did it again, and then I did it again, and then I did it again, and I did it again. I remember when I first decided to be a little more animated, right? And walk out away from the podium, right? Get out from just behind the podium. So I got out there, and then I thought, how do you get back? Remember those times doing something for the first time. So learn communication. How to affect other people with words. That's the greatest art in the world. To learn how to affect other people with words. Key phrase. Don't be lazy in language. If you learn to use the gift of your own language wisely, it can make you a fortune and build an incredible life. Here's three other things I learned. One is to train. Training people how the business works. And then, I've used another word called teach. Train and teach, and only to say this, training people how the business works, teaching is how life works. Because here's what all of us need for the 21st century, business skills and life skills. The life skills are leadership skills. The life skills are learning how to set goals. Now, here's the ultimate skill to learn that can transform your life and the life of whoever will listen, the ability to inspire. Inspire means help people to look up a little higher than where they are and wish they could get there. And inspire them that it's possible. Here's how we inspire, by our own testimonial. If I can do it, you can do it. Here's how else we inspire, by others' testimonial. If they can do it, Mary, you can do it. Getting people to see themselves better than they are. Getting people to see themselves richer than they are. Getting people to see themselves more capable next year than they are this year. Getting to see themselves in the future. To help both your kids and your people, here's what you must learn to do. Number one, help people to see themselves as they are. If people have made mistakes, they've got to know it. You can't go on making mistakes and hope to achieve. Mistakes have to be corrected. And you've got to do it with your children. Help them to see themselves as they are. If they've messed up, here's what you've got to say. You messed up, but here's what's important as a parent. Don't leave them in the mess. Some parents tell their kids they've messed up, and then they leave them in the mess. They don't paint a better picture. Here's what you could become with just a couple of more changes. Rather than this, here's what you could be. 
So, we must help our children see themselves as they are. But here's the greatest gift, to help our children see themselves better than they are, to transport them not only past to see their mistakes, but transport them to the future to see their opportunity, to see the person they can become. My mentor had that greatest gift, to help me to see myself better than I was. At first, it was difficult to see, then I started to believe. And that's how I got here today. He said, one of these days, Mr. O, you'll walk into a room full of people, and you will hear some of them say, that's him, that's the famous man. I said, well, that could never happen to me. He said, trust me, if you keep working hard on the disciplines like you're doing right now, that'll happen. You'll walk into a room full of people, and you'll hear one say, that's him, that's the famous man. He saw it, and he tried to get me to see it, and now finally, it's happened. I think when I walked in here today, I think I heard someone say, that's him, that's the famous man. And if it can happen for me, it can happen for you. Just master these skills to inspire. Here's what else I learned. The skills of building an organization. I learned to work with the people who deserve it, not the people who need it. You must be like life itself, respond to deserve, not to need. It doesn't say, if you need, you will have a harvest. It doesn't say, if you need a harvest, you'll have a harvest. That's not what it says. It says, if you plant, chances are good you'll have a harvest. If you plant, you will reap. Not if you need, you will reap. So, we must be like life itself. Respond to the people who deserve it by planting, by taking the first step. Even God himself says, if you move toward me, I'll move. That's the condition. You move toward me, I'll move toward you, says the Almighty. Now, he could also say, you don't move, I don't move. You say, well, that's arbitrary. Well, when you're God, you can set it up that way. Learn to work with the people who deserve it, not the people who need it. Now, here's what's the next step. Teach people how to deserve your time. Teach people how to deserve your attention. Teach people how to deserve a phone call. Hey, Mary, you just take this one step, and I take two steps. You take two steps, I take five steps. You don't step, I don't. But this isn't hard. You step, I step. You respond, I respond. You try, I try. You make a call, I back you up, right? Learn to teach people how to deserve your time and your attention. Next, I learned to work by group more than in. Here's why. 80% of the people do 20% of the business. So, 20% of the people, you can work with individually. You have to work with by group. But group is very powerful, less confrontational than individual. Here's what's important for all of you to learn. You can help 1,000, but you can't carry three on your back. You can help 1,000, but you can't carry three on your back. And I'm sure all of you have already gotten that experience, even though you've been here a short time. Some people will try to get on your back. That's where we got that expression, get off. Somebody discovered somebody on his back and said, what? I can't carry you. Get off. Now, if you're like some I see here, six feet four, and you weigh 300 pounds, you might carry one. And if you were really big enough, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar or something, you might carry two. But you can't carry three. When babies are born, they were not designed just to be carried all their life. Someday, you gotta try your legs. Someday, you gotta try your wings. Someday, you gotta try. Even if you fall down, you gotta try. Cause you can't just crawl around all your life. You can't be carried all your life. So, as quickly as possible, you can help 1,000, but you can't carry three. Next, don't expect the pear tree to bear apples. I used to try to change everything. You can hang apples on a pear tree. I'm telling you it won't help. You can put up a sign. This is an apple tree. Sure enough, come the season, pears. Here's what I learned. You cannot change people, but they can change themselves. You cannot change people, but they can change themselves. Incredible capital in your business isn't what matters. Okay? It's not the money that buys you a future. It's your skills that buy you a future. Money and no skills, and I'm telling you, you're still poor. Money and no ambition. Where are you? Money and no courage, you're broke. A little bit of money and a whole lot of courage, that's all we need. I'm looking for people and I'm recruiting. Back in those days, and the money didn't matter. 
What mattered to me was somebody's willingness, somebody's ingenuity, somebody's willingness to try. If they had a dollar to invest, that was plenty for me. A dollar and some ambition, and I can show you how to get rich. And it'll be one of the classic stories of the company. I go to recruit somebody, they say, I don't have any money. See, I've been looking for you for six months. Let me show you how to do it without any money. Cause here are the rules of capitalism. Got this down. You can either buy and sell, or if you're in certain circumstances, you can sell and buy. If you've got ambition. Now, if you haven't got ambition, we can't cure that. And money won't cure lack of ambition. But if you've got a dollar and some ambition, I'll show you how to get rich. A dollar, ambition, and a unique product. What a combination. Cause here's what that'll do. If you've got a dollar and some ambition and a unique product, that'll qualify you for great wealth, high self-esteem, recognition in the marketplace. One of the stories of the company, it only took me six months to find you, but I'm here. Here's what I'm looking for in the community, people that are willing to try. I've been looking for you for six months. Now, I finally found you. Now, you say, I don't have any money. That's all right. Come on, I'll show you how to do it without any money. But if you've got a dollar, some ambition, and a unique product, wow, what a combination. Come on, let's go show the world how to do it. You qualify for wealth, high self-esteem, recognition, trophy on the mantle above the fireplace. All of this from a dollar, ambition, and a unique product. So, that's all you need to know to be recruited by me. If you don't have a dollar, you need to get one. And if you don't have a unique product, you need to find one. And if you don't have any ambition, you need to develop some. And then, I'll show you how to get rich. Here's what it doesn't take. More money than you've got. More time than you've got. More intelligence than you've got. Don't need any of those. Just a dollar, some ambition, and a unique product. Now, here's my invitation. I'll teach you how to earn millions. You don't need any more intelligence than you've got. You don't need any more money than you've got. You don't need any more time than you've got. You don't need any more contacts than you've got. What an invitation. I'll teach you how to earn millions. If you've got a dollar, some ambition, and a unique product, come with me. You qualify. I'll show you how to get rich. One of the stories of the company.